I will present today um, my work that I've done over the last uh, two and a half years, basically, or at least in part, um, what I've done over the last two and a half years. Um, this is, I've uh, put up the title of open peer replication with CRDTs. I will clarify what this is um, during the talk. So I haven't um, exactly stopped the time yet. I hope I will stay in one hour, but <laughs> maybe less, I hope less. So, okay, first of all, an overview. I will um, give a motivation. This is most important for me because I really would like um, to discuss with people um, what I think is important, whether this is important, my approach is, is valid. Um, and then we will go into technical details. So we'll try to cover um, a little bit of everything of the whole replication system um, until the end. And then we will also see a, a demo and I will show you a social network application. So you will, you will do a technical hands-on part in, if, if you will, but um, first of all, I would like to discuss a little bit why at all bother about these things because there are um, already so many solutions and why um, I'm not satisfied with them. So, uh, first of all, um, we all probably know this um, right now because we have had so many um, scandals um, in general or situations where um, big IT businesses um, were involved in using data in a way which was not really um, in the interest of their users. So you can, you can say that today most big IT businesses actually um, are in the data business, not necessarily in the software business. Even Microsoft is moving away, trying to get into the cloud business and, and, and bringing pe people onto the platform. You, I probably know about SAP HANA, so there the idea is in general if, if um, all your clients are um, in your database or using your database and the data is in there, then this is a very powerful um, way of vendor login, if you will. I'm just taking a certain perspective. You can see this differently and we can discuss this in the end. But um, you can say this is a form also of domination because nowadays we are so dependent on these cloud services and they are very highly profitable. So um, even though the, 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 the biggest part of the software stack is now open source and you can basically rebuild everything, even these cloud architectures if you want to, in, in part, it's not really possible to, um, to compete with them. Um, so we have more and more um, privatized internet silos. Um, and what you then get is if you start to use them, for example, if you build your application on top of them, build some programming and so on, then you get an API to program against, but the data is basically in this platform. It's proprietary in many, many cases, or at least it's very difficult to move it out. And you get an, an abonnement if you want to, to your data and other people's data. So this is basically how many business models um, arise around modern data management. Um, what I personally find, find interesting and what really motivates me to think about this is that I like statistics. So this is what I actually like a little bit more than the databases. But um, in this case, you can only apply statistics when you are the vendor on these big platforms. So basically, Google has almost all the data in the world. So they can do all the fancy things. But if you are not with Google, then what you can do is you can do some interesting research and so on. But you cannot really do the same kind of stuff. You cannot do the same statistics and you will not even ever know what they know about you. So this can be also very scary because in case of Google, they have all the, the search uh, um, in your profile, all the, the terms you search for and so on, your search, your, your, your browsing habits. You probably all know this, but just there, there seems to be a problem there and there's a general trend which is seemingly accelerating even though there are so many concerns. So. There have been attempts at this. I mean, this is not the first time the diagnosis is probably valid at least since 10 years or so. I don't know. There have been many attempts from the free software community to build um, distributed architectures where they try to um, basically solve uh, certain problems. And examples that you might know that I've used at some point, I'm also not an expert in them, but are, for example, uh, GNUnet, um, FreeNet. Different, uh, different darknet, these are different darknet solutions. So um, in these solutions, you basically have uh, a privacy and you have very strong uh, cryptography. And then you um, 
they, they try to shield you basically from any type of statistical analysis that anybody can track you and so on. So they have an inherent property, at least in my experience and the way that they are designed, even the Tor network in some sense has this, these problems that they scale badly. So you, you uh, get a lot of latency that's even intended because, because of your latency, I can track you in the network, I can induce latency and so on in different parts. That's a way to attack the Tor network, for example. So if you want to solve all these problems together, you probably have to um, um, sacrifice scalability. Um, and they try to avoid data pooling for statistics. So this is something that I wouldn't try to avoid in the beginning. So, so I would defer in this, this respect. There are also other approaches which are interesting, which I've also used at some point. Probably you know you know some more. Um, is uh, these are diaspora, Fendica, it was a certain time when um, people tried to approach the social network uh, um, that has evolved as Facebook, or this, this approach at least in, in a more distributed fashion and give the users back the control over their data. Um, there's also Twister, which is um, an interesting combination of um, different techniques to solve the particular problem of um, microblogging. Um, right. The problem uh, with many of these systems, for instance, Diaspora in the beginning built on MongoDB, and they had a lot of problems um, implementing the, the te technology right. And this distributed systems are really, really um, hard. I mean, building them is, is, is a research topic. It's, you always have trade-offs. And um, once you have some architecture in place, it's often difficult or impossible to change it because it's deployed everywhere and you cannot get people to agree upon changes. There are some examples where this works. For example, at the moment, the um, um, blockchain uh, community has a, a soft fork for uh, Ethereum uh, working, so you can agree in some cases with uh, parts of the network and, and upgrade the technology, but it, this is a problem. And then you have... Uh, Basically, what, what is solved is read scaling, you can say. So BitTorrent and Armude and many distributed networks um, nowadays have very efficient algorithms to distribute blocks of binary data that are not mutable and are not changing. So if you have some data you just want to distribute, then this problem is solved, basically. Uh, okay. Then if you are trying to build a um, sophisticated application nowadays, you have a lot of options. I mean, you have very mature, feature-rich um, uh, space of backend technology. You can, for instance, use React, you can use CouchDB, you can use Cassandra. Um, I personally used also the Atomic, which is a really nice combination of them, together with the Relational Query Engine, um, which is more powerful than, than uh, SQL, for example. Um, these solutions um, scale very well, usually, as, at least as long as you can um, as you can accept their semantics, so um, they have certain um, consistency uh, guarantees, um, but not all of them are really well defined. I mean, there are examples I can also show you. I don't know if you know the Call Me Maybe blog series. It's really funny to see how these different solutions fail um, in actually tracking all the right operations and they claim they have, and then afterwards you check it and it's not there, even though um, the documentation and the consistency that you're supposed to get should actually provide them, but then they are not there and so on. So there are examples for MongoDB, Redis, Elasticsearch, and there are no benchmarks to try to reveal these problems. Many people don't care. It's just good enough to have more data in there, even if there's some something missing. But it can be really, really bad if you try to track bugs or, or find out what the problem is. Um, so these solutions, in, I would argue, this is now my point, they are really nice. I mean, there are, they are um, excellent engineers working on them. There's no doubt about it. And you can get many of them as open source and you can get super, uh, very good services. But in a sense, they make the problem worse. I mean, now it's even easier to go to some cloud provider, uh, get up some interesting app idea, lock in the user's data and just sell it in a way. So this is now the model to, to build applications for, for many startups, at least that I know, or, or people who are trying to approach this area, they, they basically take this, this view that, oh, just let's get the data, let's get the users, and at some point we are there and then we have the possibility to, to find a business model around this. Um, and 
the idea in this in these solutions is the backend does all the heavy lifting, and the clients are just consuming uh, consuming um, views um, like, for instance, web frontends. But even apps nowadays, I mean, they have some state probably locally cached, um, but they are still and some logic, but if you want to do anything complicated, then you have to talk to the central system. Um, I've added another slide for the blockchains because they are so famous now. Um, I don't know if you are involved with them, with them, but a lot of people see that this is the promise of the future for distributed systems, and you can use them in a peer-to-peer -peer setting, and there are all these smart guys working on them. And basically what they do is they model a central um, transaction log, so um, they model strong consistency. The system is always um, agreeing on a certain state of, of, if you want to, of the database or any data type. Um, and the way this is achieved is by implementing some, some um, consensus protocol. So the first example of this, which was uh, really successful, is proof of work by Bitcoin where you basically have to um, solve a difficult um, cryptographic problem um, and then you can mine a block and um, if enough people have seen your block first and you're the first one to have solved this problem, then the network converges to, um, to the new block that you have created and this is appended to the chain. So this is a way to achieve consensus. There's also proof of stake, which, is not, uh, which does not need the same amount of work. This is, for instance, um, a, a, Explored by the Ethereum community for the version two. There are also some um, implementations right now. I think Lisk is claiming that they have some. Just as there's a fancy space of many cryptocurrency systems and blockchain technology systems, there's also proof of importance, which is a mixture. People try to figure out what the right approach is. But what I want to um, uh, uh, convey here is that um, this is just a way to to define consensus. It doesn't really change a lot about traditional um, database systems. So a traditional system has, um, for instance, Paxos, which is a, um, a, a proven, a not really trivial algorithm. To be honest, I haven't studied it yet, so I just know that it works. It's not that I, I, I know how it works. Um, and they use these systems just also to get a consensus on, on how to um, um, continue with the, with the database log in, in, in situations of conflicts and so on in distributed system. So, um, and then there are also these ways um, that they um, also take different aspects of um, the application, the particular application that is involved into the way that the consensus is achieved. So for instance, in Ethereum or in Bitcoin, in Ethereum in particular, um, you have a, a programming model and every instruction costs a certain amount of virtual money and so on so you have to balance all that out so that it really works and it scales and it does the right thing um, and then you try to optimize it for the joint um, uh, system objective okay right um, as a developer i mean i came from a little bit different angle i've seen these systems i've, I've, I've been interested in them but what we all know is distributed version control systems because we work with them probably every day and they are really <coughs> important i mean Without them, you, um, your workflow is a lot um, less efficient and, and transparent to you. So there's Git, of course, there's Mercurial, there's the original one, or, the, or at least an early one, which is Dart um, from the Haskell community, where they've also defined an al algebra over um, uh, edit operations and so on. Um, this is used now um, with uh, a lot of cooperation on GitHub. I mean, it's really interesting to see such a huge community of people working efficiently together with, um, I would say, state-of-the-art tools in many cases because they are really easy to, to learn. They are approachable. Git itself is really difficult to learn if you are not familiar with the command line and are not a programmer. But on GitHub, for instance, you can you really now have a community. Um, but Git itself, I mean, if you use GitHub, this problem is basically solved, but it has no um, automatic replication. So you always have to um, tell the system. So it's, it's not like a like joint dis distributed system. You always have to say push, pull. You have to exactly know what the network topology is and synchronize different um, um, machines with each other. Um, you can use it for data. People have done this and you can do this. Um, but it's not exactly very efficient, so I would argue that um, Git is not really built 
for a database solution. There are aspects which are really nice, and I'm, I'm mentioning this now because later on we will cover them in a little bit different um, formalism. Um, but Git itself, you, you can use it, but I don't think you gain too much if you put data into Git because all the tools are made for developing source code and line-based uh, uh, um, uh, text files, so this this doesn't help you that much to, to build a database, for example. Um, and, right, so most most um, people would, if, if they would take a naive approach at, at Git, uh, using Git for a distributed system, they would actually put some, um, uh, would try to put some SQL database in there, and that's also not trivial to actually model a database um, inside a system like this, because you have to act, you have to then implement a transaction log, you have to implement indices, and so on. So if you want to do something non-trivial, I mean, then you basically reinvent uh, uh, the system anyway. Um, so my idea at some point two, two years ago or so was, well, what I really would like to do is I, I mean, I would like, I would like to have a system um, where I could clone the application state. So compared to, um, to the source code approach where I can go on GitHub and clone uh, some application and develop it. Um, and, and, and change it and so on. This would really be nice if I would have clean data semantics to to use um, uh, to use a, um, an existing user base and um, take the data and build a different application on top or in some aspect of it, or maybe even fork it uh, at some point, which would probably be in the interest of the users if, if, if people could do this, because then if somebody tries to lock you in in a way, or even if the free software community around the product is not really working that well. You still can get um, you can get the data, which is more crucial than than actually the, the source code. I would argue from this this point. Um, you could then share the encrypted application data, um, and you can build diff different code bases around it. So this is uh, uh, basically the idea. And um, yeah, and the the point is, if you have a system where you where you really what we really write the uh, really would like to do is um, you can alter the state on any point and it's still converging. So you you basically you decouple the network topology and the idea that you are somewhere in the system from the way that you interact with the data. So if I change the data on some server then in the end the whole system will converge and I don't have to worry how it is doing this. So um, this would be really nice. And then um, the ultimate goal is that you can do statistical analysis um, with a more open-minded approach and maybe even get data from users more easily. So because the problem today is most apps, they try to do it themselves. I mean, if there is no clean interface to the data and the user has, the user has no interest in, in sharing the data through the application, then there is no way for a third party to step in and actually provide a statistical analysis like recommendation systems like Amazon where they tell you what you should put in your in your basket um, and so on or recommend friends, recommend different services, media, YouTube and so on. So this can only be done by one service provider now. Or it's, it's at least difficult. You can do it through APIs but you can always uh, only get a, a tiny amount of data. For instance, if you try to mine tweets um, and you don't want to pay a lot of money to Twitter, uh, you have to mine them beforehand and then you can use them afterwards for statistical analysis, but it's very restrictive. So, so while the tweets are online and you can scrape them from the web if you have the, the, the power to do it, you cannot really access this data. So it's, it's really bad for, for a situation like this. So in summary, to, to simplify it, um, the idea is free all data if you want to. So this would, would be what, what I think would be ideal and, and would really help the situation. Um, so now we have a problem. I mean, if we, if we try to do this, and that's what I found out um, mostly over the, the last two years, is that what, what this code is, is saying actually that it's very easy to come up with um, uh, some ideas. And then if you try to implement them, they, um, they really contradict each other and it's really difficult to, to implement them. So. Um, and this is especially true in distributed systems. Because um, you probably know this, I've just put it up on the slides because it captures it still very well. There are um, 
other approaches, there is the consistency, availability, uh, and, and, and uh, partition-free cap theorem, which catches the, the, the trade-offs between these three um, uh, attributes of a distributed system. Um, partition-free means it is, um, it is um, resistant to splits or partitioning in the system. That's what I mean. Um, and um, what you basically need to do, which is intuitive, if you have a decentral system, um, and different parts of the system write, and they cannot see each other and coordinate, then you have to merge a conflict afterwards. And you have to deal with the situation. So either um, you, um, you can merge this and the system doesn't allow you to, to put order in, or um, you, have to, um, you have to remove the, uh, you, you have to remove availability from one, one part of the system when it's not vis visible. That's typically a minority uh, partition. So if you have some consensus uh, in the network, then the minority um, partition loses availability. Um, and this is very well studied. This is an active field of research. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of interest also from, from the big um, data providers and cloud providers to um, solve these problems internally in their data centers and um, especially around the globe, because now we have many big data centers, uh, we have micro data centers, they are now trying to, to figure out how to scale out and how to bring the data closer to the clients to reduce latency and so on. So these, system, these problems evolve in an open system, uh, these, these, these problems show up in an open system, but they also show up, of course, in, in proprietary systems. Um, the fact is, though, even though there's this theory and many solutions build upon it, there are many, many more systems and even professional database vendors which still try to sell you the impossible. I mean, they, they put up some idea that you could have a consistent system, which is, I mean, I've, I've put it up here. It's just to show that, obviously, since these three circles don't mesh, that's an obvious proof. Uh, you can have all three of them. No, I mean, that's just a typical way to show that it's exclusive. It's not really symmetric, and it's not that easy. That's what has been found out uh, now. Um, so you can have different consistency levels. and can still explore the trade-offs. You can also get worse than that. But the best you can get when you still um, uh, uh, can have petitions and availability is called strong eventual consistency. But there are many fine-grained um, formalisms for different levels of consistency. Okay, so this basically is, is, is the background, what's there, and now I would like to talk a little bit of um, how I try to approach it. So you know, you know that I would like to have an open peer-to-peer -peer system. I would like to have a system which is obviously also working um, when there are petitions, because if it's an open system, I can never ensure that there are the majority of, of nodes online or there, there are arbitrary petitions over the internet and so on. Um, it's in principle, I've called it replicative because it's replicating uh, the data. That's the idea. Um, it is nothing fundamentally true, so I have not reinvented the wheel. I'm also not uh, such a smart guy that I've come up with, some, uh, with something which hasn't been di there before. I've recombined some of these ideas um, in, in a particular case I will show you in a moment. But um, in, in it, the idea is just you use this replication layer, you drop it into your application, you can interact with it in a way that you do with Git or with a database locally. Um, you can see um, the, the data changes locally and it is um, automatically propagating and also seeing the changes from elsewhere so it can also be reactive on when um, other parts of the system change. So this is also done by other systems, of course, but um, we will see how this um, is composed. Um, right, and I've, I've decided because I'm convinced that you should start with uh, some, some sense of minimalism and for the actual, um, for the logic, you just need some Turing complete programming language and the browser is not that bad, so why not start with um, the, the, the um, most restricted environment and uh, be able to deploy it inside websites because web development is actually very painful if you have to, I mean, you have some sample server, then you start to have 
distributed clients. Um, in the beginning, you just synchronize everything with the server and put everything in requests or at least try to communicate it. And then most web applications look at some point, they do a lot of ad hoc messaging and updating and you try to do something locally and cache it and reduce the latency. And often these, these setups become really complicated, although it's just web technology. So, um, but it's also possible to use this on the back end. In fact, it's the same code base. Um, just the, the I.O. operations differ for the browser and, and, and the JVM. So um, I've started with WebSockets, obviously, and some key value store protocol and something like this and built some building blocks. Um, but in general, um, the technology is cross-platform. Okay, so then the idea is, okay, we want to have a system where people can openly develop applications and share data. Um, I've worked on a voting system before, which is part of where always this, this popped up again. I mean, if you try to, to build a system where users um, should be able to participate and you want to reach consensus, then you always have to also allow them uh, to in some way disagree with the technology. So in this situation, often it was like the vote counts or the way that the, the voting system is arranged always has to be forkable. So you need to make to expose this state. So this is also where I've seen this, okay, we have again this problem again, and then at some point I thought, okay, this is a foundational problem, and it is um, also happening in, in, in general applications, not only if you try to build some voting tool. So um, this is where, where, where I came from. And um, the idea is then just give everybody a fair way. So there, for where we to store, store state. So you have a global place, which is um, your user ID, which can be a mail or something else. And for every data type you um, try to use, you just create a user ID, which is very unlikely to, to collide with anything. So you have really a large space and everybody can just, from, from the address space, you can just put everything in there. Um, so this is how it looks like. I've also put some data structure down there, but I'm not sure whether you can see it. It's just that it looks like this. Um, okay. And then there are, um, this, so this is for the state part. And then there are the, the peers. This is the network topology. Um, so we don't have, want to have a distinction between servers and clients because it's a peer to peer approach. And basically we're just syn synchronizing state. So there's nothing inherently server or client, or there's no asymmetry in, in the way that, um, that you have to um, replicate data types in the beginning. Um, so we use a publish and subscribe protocol at the core, um, which distributes to different um, peers um, to which you are connected. And um, then I've, I've um, decoupled certain specific functionality into middlewares just to um, use messaging. I use messaging basically everywhere. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is how it looks like. I can just make that a little bit bigger um, for this example. So here you would have two peers, peer A and peer B. You have some wire, which is a WebSocket connection, and then there are different um, uh, middleware. So you have pull hooks, like for Git. So if some, some data type changes, I can actually pull directly the changes into another one, which is from another user, for example. So this is the way the current application is implemented. There are, uh, of course, other ways to do it. Um, Everything is cryptographically hashed, so I only have to track the, the data type metadata. Everything else is consistent um, and cannot collide, and you cannot attack it. That was really important, at least for this part in the beginning. So I cannot put some values in some part of the system, let them propagate, and then suddenly um, a value can, could have, or a hash could, um, ID could have several, uh, several values. Um, and Right. So, so the fetching of these values, which are part of the metadata and so on, it's not, not part of the core. That's just a design issue, but I think it's interesting that you can decompose it that way. Um, most people probably have done something like that. Okay, okay so at the moment I'm using a gossip-like protocol, which just... Um, propagates the changes when it hasn't seen them. That's a very simple way to do it, but it's not necessarily bad. And it's um, easy to change it because um, it's just an aspect of the network topology. So I try to, to keep everything in the beginning um, that I can 
address different concerns separately. So I try to decompose them. You just have the networking and the network topology on one level, just deal with the data type and the semantics and the algebra on one level and so on, and just find the right way to, to model the abstractions between them, uh, and yes, between them, and, and solve optimization problems and other things later. Um, Okay, so this you can imagine it's just like a wavefront. So if I induce a change here and it goes over several peers, then we'll just propagate um, through the network. If some peers already seen a change from another one, then it will not do it again. So it's not a totally stupid broadcast pro protocol, but um, yeah, it's also not totally smart. I mean, you would probably use some minimal spanning tree algorithm. There are ones um, that, which are already proven as a prompt tree, for instance, is seemingly very efficient on the internet and can update itself and find the ideal connections between different peers um, to reduce latency in the network. So there are solutions to that. That's why I have this uh, somewhat simple approach. And um, right, peers are subscribed to each other. We've already seen this for, for different data types in this global namespace. Um, and at the moment, I say that meta. I mean, then the problem is how how do you actually um, imagine that the data is shared? But that's not too important. I mean, at the moment, all data is replicated everywhere, but that's not strictly necessary. I mean, you can also theoretically propagate metadata only, and you can use um, for these values that you are referencing. They are basically immutable, so you can also use something like a. a um, uh, BitTorrent's um, block exchange protocol to to distribute these uh, data types. I haven't explored it yet. So if you have experience, I'm, I'm interested in talking about this. Um, okay, so maybe this is the most interesting thing if you ever happen to implement a scalable uh, distributed system. This is the CRDT part. Um, I will not cover it in detail because it's, it's, it's a little bit theoretic and um, there is very good documentation that you can read up yourself and also talks. But um, it's interesting, they are very well studied data types. They are uh, strong, eventual, consistent data types. So they are always available. Um, you can basically um, build, uh, if, you, if you manage to use them, you can, you have solved all these problems that we've talked uh, about before, but you don't get strong consistency out of them. So you cannot model a transaction log of database or anything that's sequential. Um, uh, like uh, uh, history. You have a partial order on write operations, so there are always parts which are parallel and you have to then decide how to resolve them. Um, but there is no synchronization needed, so they are, for instance, used by industry, for instance, by some um, So um, we would like to do peer to peer um, synchronization with CRDTs. CRDTs are conflict free replicated data types, um, they are really well studied. I will just talk about them here briefly, but they are underlying um, most of the work from the theoretical side. So the rest is technology and the way to design the system, and you still have to figure that out. But you have to solve the central problem. And most distribute or many distributed uh, architectures have not really um, a strong sound formalism at their core. This is a weakness. Um, if you try to bolt it on later, um, it's really difficult to do that. So CRVTs are now uh, fairly well understood. Um, they are used by industry, there's for instance SoundCloud, there are talks about uh, them. If you Google for them, you will find many presentations. I mean, um, React uh, has, has them integrated, for instance, in a new version, and they are trying to, to really build that in because there are many high volume um, partners, for instance, um, uh, um, uh, betting companies who do not try to lose any dollar um, in their in their business and or Angry Birds the company they want to have um, they, they want to have you playing in the plane and still see the ads and so on and count the ads that you've seen so they can get money even if you are offline so there are many people who have similar needs and, and, and try to to um, to really ex explore and exploit these 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 data types. Um, there are, of course, also different formalisms, so this is not the only way to formalize them or formalize an eventual consistent system. Um, you, the, the advantage of them is you don't need any synchronization in the sense that you, the, um, replicas never need to talk to each other to um, execute any write operations. They can um, reconciliate afterwards at any point 
Um, the problem is if, if they want to do it at any point, then um, they need to keep track of their history. So this is something which needs to be um, needs to be solved. Um, if you try to have many write operations in your system, um, one way to do this is to track all the replicas and uh, see how far they have evolved, and then just um, uh, they can cut all the history that is older than that. This is a common approach, which can be used, for instance, by vector clocks, but then you need to know and track the whole network topology, which can be um, easily as painful, or it can be also very painful to have all these vector clocks and thousands of clients and people writing in the system, and you have to track all of them. So there are some smart ideas. The Swift Cloud system that is mentioned at some point here in the paper as well, in the final slides, is an approach that is uh, done by a EU research group that I've talked to um, also. Um, and these data types scale very well. Um, and now my idea in the beginning was I started with Git and as I said to myself, okay, I want to have something like Git and the commit and transactions and history and so on and I have to, this kind of data type just for data and I wanted to use it for transaction log and not for, um, for source code management. So can I do this as a CRDT? And I mean, obviously you cannot because it's strongly consistent if you try to have the sequential order and operations. Um, but maybe you can you can find some compromise, like most systems try to do. So this is what I did, and I um, developed a data type which I uh, coined um, confluent distributed version control system or conflict free, uh, if you want to. So I, you can imagine it's just good for data, um, and it's also in this replicating framework. So the difference again with Git is the operations that you can do on the repository, um, which are not um, which induce conflicts in the network. So this data type, if there is a conflict between two replicas, the network still converges on all replicas to the same state, and you can um, solve the conflict on any replica in the network topology. So this is basically a difference. It's not a big difference, but it is a difference. If you, if you try to do it with Git, you always have to explicitly say, at this point now, I want to synchronize with this other guy over there. And then this other guy wants to synchronize at some point. That's intentional because um, then you can deal with conflicts on a very focused way and you can do rebases and things like this. But in a, data, um, in a database, you don't want to do this. Um, usually because you want to push changes as fast as possible and you cannot put the burden of the operations on the user. So you still want to have an automatic replication system. So this is why I've, I've, I've started to take this approach or why I've used this data type so far. And basically Git is a directed asymptotic graph and it uses the lowest common ancestor search. So um, to resolve conflicts, you just track what is your last common ancestor, and then you can um, do a three-way merge um, in, 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 in Git, or you can just look at this part of the graph and see which part is parallel in the graph. We will also see this later. And then you have to decide who comes first and how to reorder the right operations or whether you really try to track them when you're trying to merge. Okay, so we now have... Uh, this is simulatus uh, approach of the git commit graph. Uh, we have a well understood API. We can pull, we can merge, we can commit. Um, we can uh, um, develop the application like a native application locally. So I think building distributed systems, even, even if you use, I mean, especially if you use something like JavaScript and, and take a naive approach, which many people do, like I just want to build this nice website and so on. I've seen this a few times now. Um, it gets complicated really quickly. I mean, you have these frameworks and they solve a lot of problems like, like AngularJS or I don't know what people are using nowadays. I use React mostly because I, I like this approach, but um, it's, it's really difficult to, to, to figure out all this distributed semantics in, inside of the framework. So now you can, um, it's actually easy, easier for the developer because um, you have this uh, um, converging network topology and you can develop your app uh, locally, you just have to take these remote changes into account, and you need to do conflict resolution. And that's that's a it's somewhat also a heavy trade-off. So you have to keep that in mind that at some point you have to um, do conflict resolution. But um, 
you you otherwise you don't need any networking or server side development. You don't don't need to set up your apps. You don't need to deal with a big stack and so on. So you just can deploy it in a website and it runs like an app if you want to. Um, okay. So I already said that Git has no automatic distribution. Um, some of these um, Git, exactly, and it aborts on these these conflicts. So I already said this. So here's just an example scenario where um, you probably know Git because there's no problem. So on the right hand side you see the time. So I will go through uh, four time steps. In the beginning you have you have Alice and Bob. These are two users of the system, um, and they have two of these data types: one for work and one for lunch, um, which basically um, have, have a commit graph below them. And now if if they change this. Um, lunch date in their um, in their um, time tracking calendar application, then um, you get this conflict. It's propagating automatically in the network. So at some point T1, both not necessarily at the same time. See this on the right hand side. You see that the updates are propagating. That's common visualization. I've just put it up here that the graphics. So it's like a timeline going from top to the bottom. You always see one step um, below each other and. Then um, Alice decides to merge it, and in the end, and decides on the date. So it's it's 1 p.m. that they should meet meet for lunch, and then Bob will see the result, and the application converges. The important thing um, is that they don't do not merge both um, automatically at the same time, because then you get a diverging system. We will have to look into this later. Um, and what we do, in a sense, is we take the conflict. When it um, evolves, when you see, whenever um, these, these data types are synchronized in any part of the network, when a conflict um, emerges, um, it just gets, it's part of the value and you can still propagate it. It's not something that you really have to solve uh, locally at this two replicas because otherwise, I mean, in Git you cannot really push a conflict to somebody else. Uh, at least I'm not aware of it. I mean, in theory, it would be possible, but that's not the way that you use Git. You always have to, if it pops up, then you have to merge first, and then you can push again. You cannot push something like three, four, five heads on a branch somewhere else. That's not intended. That's not how you, you deal with that. Here, it's in, in theory possible, because you then want to resolve it on any endpoint. I mean, as a user, you can imagine um, when you introduce a conflict, you, you may be at your mobile phone in the next step or at your laptop, um, and you want to be able to resolve it anywhere, not just um, on the device that just happened to be the one who saw the conflicting update first. Um, you have to deal in this case with this divergence trade-offs, and um, then you can also reintroduce these strong consistency um, semantics again. So just, um, again, this is like, how do you build this internally? It's very simple. I mean, you can imagine that this is JSON. It's not JSON, but it's, it's, it's similar in a sense. And you just have a graph, which is a dictionary, and you just have heads pointing into this graph. And with that, you can basically resolve all the issues. So that's a, that's a reason why I not, I've not decided to, to really um, to take Git, all of Git, and, and, and reuse this because I have the impression from what I've seen, I mean, it's a C code base, which is not really small, and it's not necessarily easy to understand and to implement all the idiosyncrasies, which are not necessarily... I mean, you have to implement um, a lot of this stuff. Again, there are some libraries, but if you really want to pick something, it's easier to just take the, 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 the this theoretical part, and it wasn't really difficult um, to implement the core algorithms. In fact, this was fairly easy. Um, okay, uh, this is just now that you put a database into this, so so um, a commit can have an arbitrary amount of transactions. It's really not important, but in the database, you can just have many of these transactions. So later you will see when we have a Twitter-like application, you maybe want to put many like operations or many many things like this into one big commit, and you don't want to commit on the same granularity uh, as you're uh, doing writes in the application. That's just a way to decouple this. Um, right. And 
the, the way that's modeled is you have um, a reduction over the whole transaction history. You can also specify which functions you use. So different parts in the network, what I all, uh, already earlier said is, maybe your application is Twitter, but if you want to use it later, it's better if you know what the parameters were and which function was applied to the application state than just, just see the result. In Git, you basically just see the result um, in the file system. Git is uh, as an, as separated from your application on the file system level. Whenever you change your files, Git will just see, okay, there are changed lines. These hashes in the file system tree have changed. So I have to have a look at them, what lines have changed. I do this delta, and then I store these uh, internally as, as blobs and, and, and track this, um, this change set. But I don't know what, where the changes came from and what the parameters were. So it would be really nice, and that's that's what you can do, is actually you track all the changes, and then you apply the functions whenever you need the value. You can still cache everything in between and even distribute that. Um, it has just has the same semantics. Um, right. So this is for the database part. And yeah, there are special CRDTs. Maybe this, this goes too far. Okay. Yes. Okay, so... We are, we are approaching the end. Um, there is just a way, what I've said is, the, the nice thing is I wanted to start with parts that I can plug together and, 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 and that are reusable. And you can still upgrade them if you want to, to a traditional system. So if you have this um, system, you can still do some um, strong consistency protocol to decide who is able to commit. There's no problem in that. I mean, you could have a web service, which is Paxos, and if you cannot reach it, or some central peer, who is telling you, okay, now you are allowed to commit um, and you have to coordinate to do some two-phase commit or some, some coordination protocol with this central peer and then you lose availability and you cannot write. I mean, you can reintroduce in a weekly uh, um, eventual, uh, strong eventual consistent, but a, not strong consistent system, a weak, weakly consistent system. You can introduce strong consistency at any point. Um, so, you can also do this blockchain things if you like to. Might be interesting. Um, okay, so some problems that I've faced. Um, as I said, I've worked for this on some time. The initial prototypes weren't that difficult. Um, it gets more difficult now that I started to implement authentication and this doesn't work as expected. And then you have some, some problems like how do I change the keys and the uh, credentials and so on in the system in a way that it's still controllable and it's also eventually consistent and you don't reintroduce any problems so you then get, if you start to build different systems on top, you want to, to try to express them in the semantics of the system, but that's not necessarily um, easy. So some problems that I faced are scaling problems in general. I mean, this, this data type, I've, I've come from this, this Git approach, it, it is not scalable in the same way that normal CRDTs are. I mean, there you can write just on every replica as fast as you want to, and you just wait. I mean, as long as the network has some time to catch up at some point, your system is guaranteed to converge. In this way, it's, a, it's the case that if different um, replicas write at the same time to the same data type, for example, in the calendar application, um, then you have to resolve these merge conflicts, and if you are automatically merging, um, in, in your application, or you, you, you use some merge protocol, then if the um, convergence of the network is too slow, the merges will actually cause the system to diverge. So that's what I've seen in the beginning when I to didn't totally understand what, what I was doing at some point. Um, I, I tried to automatically merge, and of course, all the devices that I had, all the tablets, laptop, and so on, they just started firing at each other. Every, every device started to, I mean, they, they basically did a denial of service attack on each other. So this is not something that you want to have. And then what, um, what, I, what I do, or what I decided to do, is just to reduce availability. So in this case, just um, each replica waits stochastically for a certain amount of time, um, and if there is more merges in the metadata, then just wait longer. So if the system is diverging, it's actually slowing down, you cannot write anymore. It's just a security, uh, a safety net if you want to. Um, okay, and another problem is that client peers, and that's something that maybe you have something to say about, is that they just need a fraction of state. So this symmetry assumption that everybody should be able to 
have all the data if they want to, even if it's encrypted, but in principle, you should be able to collaborate on a system like this and share the data. Um, is maybe not true for many cases because um, you, um, you, you have these uh, mobile clients and you cannot download all the, the, the data on them. You don't want to. Also in the browser, of course, you don't want to. So you have to find approaches to partition your state space in a way that you just subscribe to the data that's really needed for you to do your job. Um, there are, uh, as I already mentioned, SwiftCloud from the uh, group at uh, uh, TU Kaiserslautern, where I um, have been a few times and with whom I'm uh, collaborating. Um, and you can also do interesting things there um, with uh, custom data types. So if you can find, uh, if, you, if you know your conflict uh, resolution routine at the point where you are um, designing your data type for a particular application, you can um, build a, a conflict resolution mechanism into the data type, which forces all the replicas to converge and still has some of the application semantics. So the benefit of this, this um, Git-like data type is that you can control how merges um, are applied and you have a very high level of control, but you lose scalability um, if you want to go somewhere in between, between a set-like semantic or CRDT, you can also use these custom data types. An example is, is mentioned in the BAU paper, which is a really impressive paper for 1995. Um, okay, then there's some other work. I don't want to say that I'm the only one who is thinking about this or in this direction. There is SwarmJS, which is probably very closely related, which is in JavaScript. Um, I'm not really sure how well it works because I... Uh, couldn't get it to work easily and it's not totally understandable because this JavaScript I.O. callback combination stuff that people are doing is not necessarily easy to understand, I think. Um, there is now a, a, new, um, a new approach which is particular to the environment that I'm working in, which is Clojure, um, is Datsync, which is using a synchronization between the Tomic database, so it's the central server, and you have all these mobile clients and so on, but they have the same database, um, um, and it's actually streaming these changes between them, so you can have a totally reactive architecture, but you still have a central central node. There's, as I mentioned, Swift Cloud. There's also Antidote, which is built um, on Erlang and built on Rea Core, which is I think really nice environment. I mean, there. If you ever wonder who really is using Erlang, these people use Erlang a lot. I mean, they use it mostly, I would say, and probably for good reasons. Um, I haven't because I think it's still reasonable to go into the browser, and Erlang is not really browser compatible, and I didn't want to have several code bases and so on. So, and also I think there there are some benefits to closure, but it's really nice to to get into this environment. It's really strong. Uh, open source code base there thing. Then there's IPFS. You probably know this. I don't know. You've heard about it. Um, it's an um, interesting approach. I will not go too much into detail of it. I don't think that a file system is a reasonable way to approach distributed database. Um, you can, of course, do it in a way, but I think it conveys the wrong information to the developers because they just think, okay, there's a file system, I can just put my anything on top of it and write into the file system. But what you really need to do is to um, bring the set-like semantics, counters, and design your application with proper data types and think about scalability in a way, um, in a formalism, and not just use the state, this file system. But still, it's interesting, and it is used, and it is... Um, yeah, it's a nice project. And there are some others, Telepet.io, I think I've seen. There's also Hoodie AS or something, I don't know. They use PouchDB, which is also nice. Um, it's an implementation of CouchDB for the browser. And right for me, right now, um, I mean, I need to, I have implemented Erlang like error handling, which means that um, I have Go routines and so on, but I don't do uh, uh, error handling in Clojure. Um, I've implemented that with dynamic scoping, it's just detailed, so I'm, I found some problems with the underlying implementation of the library and tried to fix that, but it hasn't worked out, so I have to fix that. Um, then I have to finally release the second version of Replicative. Um, I want to improve again the, the demo application, which is Topic uh, AS, which you can also have a look at the moment. and. Um, 
Yeah, right. The, the, the actual difficult problem is the composition of CRDTs. So now what I'm, what I try to understand and what I need to do theoretically is how you get consistent updates on some level between different data types. Because you want to maybe use a set for something like hashtags. Um, you say, okay, I just want to subscribe this index because this is a topic that I'm interested in. But I also want to update my profile in a strongly consistent way because, um, it's, it's really, I mean, it's a low write intensive uh, thing, so I want to use CDBCS, this, this, this data type, and so on. So you want to compose these different data types, um, and that's uh, something which is interesting. You can use logical clocks and a way to encode dependencies between different data types, but it's it's not totally trivial, and I haven't had the time to um, to do it. And the authentication is broken. So this is a problem with the topic at the moment. It's, or it's not working. It has bugs, I would say. Okay. So finally, the demo. I just... Um, what is really nice, I mean, I've talked about all this background, about all this theory, and I mean, that's a lot of stuff. But what is really nice if you have a distributed system, because you, in, if you have any distributed system, if you have a multi-threaded system on your CPU... Already, you cannot debug in a... I mean, you cannot track what your system is really doing. It's changing every time. It's non-deterministic. But in this case, it's, if you have um, this very simple setting, so here we have a browser. This is the commit graph of the, of the data type. You can see on the top that I'm just incrementing a counter by 10. So I can do it like this. I can do time travel. And this is something that I really like. I mean, you... Usually it's difficult to understand why something is happening, and then you can just go back, and you can go forth, and you can also connect to the server, and then you will see, oh, the server has a different state. Um, so here it's 690 or something, and here it's half of that, so you can inspect this, this conflicting state, and you can also do time travel, which I think is something... I would like to have in a system like this, and it's often not really possible to understand how your state came to existence. Um, right. So, you can also, I mean, is it? you can see it, by the way, we we'll also later see this, that here it's doing all the stuff, it's saying what, it's receiving messages and so on, so. Here's all the, the, the things that are happening in the browser. So this is actually running in, in the connections just to a different replica, which happens to be the server um, in this case, but they are not otherwise related. Okay, so this should be it finally. Um, right, so there's of course the GitHub page, which um, I try to keep up to date. Uh, as much as possible and put all the information there. Um, there was, or there is a white paper, there's also now um, a, a workshop paper um, published for uh, Eurosys, but it's not, I haven't put that on there yet. You find most of the information also in this white paper. It's not as published, but I think it's, it's okay to get the idea. Um, if you really want just to know about these, these data types, I can really recommend this comprehensive study and tech report. I mean, that's what I read in the first hand, and it's covering, it's from 2012, but it's, it's covering um, most of the work. And then there is uh, Swift, the Swift Cloud paper, which is newer, you will also find references there. And what they did there is um, basically they said, okay, um, we can assign different mobile clients to a single data center. And then we don't have to track the vector clocks of all the clients, so they don't, we don't have to keep all the state. We can just coordinate between the data centers and they optimize these vector clocks so they can reduce the, the total metadata that, just, that is managed in a somewhat smart way by going a little bit more central again. Okay. So that was it. Finally. <clears throat> Bisschen viel wahrscheinlich. Zu viel. Vielleicht. Also, was ich noch zeigen kann, aber ich wette, wenn ihr jetzt da drauf geht, ich habe es 
gestern damit ein kleines Problem gehabt. Ich habe momentan nicht so viel Zeit. Um das zu fixen. Jetzt hier haben wir so eine kleine Social Network Application gebaut, wo man halt praktisch so eine Mischung aus Reddit und Twitter ähm, Sachen da reinpacken kann und dann kommentieren kann noch so ein bisschen und äh, ja, und Hashtags und bla, man kann sich dann da, ich weiß gar nicht, bin ich, bin ich angemeldet, wenn man sich da anmeldet, dann eine lustige Mail, also das funktioniert auch grundsätzlich schon, diese Authentifizierungssache war mir auch wichtig, aus praktischen Gründen, weil das immer auch was ist, was nervt, wenn man das implementieren muss, und das ist eigentlich immer irgendwie so ein bisschen dasselbe, und man kann das halt auch ohne Passwörter ganz nett machen, wenn man einfach eine E-Mail an die Person schickt, solange man dann das sich merkt und sie sich jedes Mal wieder anfragt, oder so. Das könnte sein, dass ich das jetzt schon getrostet habe. Also da laufen auch mehrere Peers im Moment davon. Das hat auch funktioniert für die Konferenzdemo, aber irgendwann dazwischen ist mir das abgeraucht. Ich habe nicht drauf aufgepasst. Und zwar das Problem ist das, dass diese Minware selbst müssen den State auch automatisch tracken. Genauso wie, also sie sind ja im Prinzip, also ich darf ja keine aus Versehen irgendwelche Konflikte oder andere Sachen einführen. Das heißt, ich muss immer dafür sorgen, dass ich, wenn, ich, wenn sich ein Datentyp ändert, ich zwar lokal irgendwelche Entscheidungen treffe, zum Beispiel in irgendeiner Middleware, aber eigentlich muss ich die synchronisieren, solange die aber nicht auf die Platte geschrieben sind, sind sie nicht wirklich synchronisiert. Also muss ich jedes Mal gucken, dass durch die Middleware immer zumindest eine atomare Sicht auf die Daten garantiert ist. Und das macht das Ganze ein bisschen komplizierter, als ich es am Anfang mir gewünscht hätte. Aber ja, das sind te technische Details, die man sich implementiert. Heißt das jetzt, du kannst keine Konflikte beheben oder du musst keine Konflikte beheben, weil du sicherstellen kannst, dass keiner auftreten? Das habe ich jetzt noch nicht so ganz verstanden. Du meinst inwiefern? Also, ne, wenn ich das richtig verstanden habe, du schreibst wie bei Git unterschiedliche History-Versionen. Ja. Yeah. Und äh, bei Git ist es ja nicht spannend, dass man unterschiedliche Histories hat, sondern wie man sie zusammenführt, wie man dann wieder merge. Genau. Ähm, und da kann es ja zu einem Konflikt kommen. Genau, also in dem Moment, wenn du zwei Histories hast, ist es ein Konflikt. So, und, und das kannst du jetzt machen oder wie, wie löst du diese Konflikte dann? Ähm, momentan löse ich diese Konflikte automatisch und mir ist es egal. Das ist ein bisschen trivial, weil ich noch nicht das implementiert habe, was ich jetzt gesagt hätte, es gibt. Also was du dann feststellen kannst, ist, dass gewisse Operationen zeitlich miteinander kollidieren. Nicht alle Operationen, auch wenn sie parallel ausgeführt sind, sind ein Problem. Mhm. Und was du dann machen würdest, ist, du gehst halt her und sagst, also der Datentyp erlaubt dir das praktisch komplett in deiner Anwendung zu machen und jederzeit auch zu ändern die Strategie. Sprich, die Anwendung kümmert sich darum, dass genau. du den Konflikt auflöst. Genau. Also es ist einfach nur ein echtzeit -Git. Ja. Okay. Ja, das tut es eigentlich ganz gut. Mhm. Wobei der Punkt halt ist, dass dieser Git-Ansatz, ich habe damit angefangen und ich finde es immer noch nützlich, auch fürs Prototyping und so, aber das Ziel war es dann schon an einem gewissen Punkt, oder ist es halt eigentlich diese Datenmanagement-Sachen in den Griff zu kriegen und dafür ist der Git-Ansatz sicherlich nicht das, was du nutzen willst, um, also du willst keine Strong Consistent System machen, das skalierbar ist, das, das, du brauchst ein System, das, das eventuell consistent ist und das heißt, du willst diese Datentypen dann eigentlich für alle Sachen benutzen, wo du nicht diese strenge Ordnung haben willst. Das heißt, wenn du einen Transaktionslog hast, wo du einfach nur Fakten irgendwie hinzufügst und es ist dir egal, in welcher Reihenfolge die hinzugefügt ja, werden, dann nimmst du... Ja, das geht auch mal wieder, wenn man jedes Mal quasi für jeden Fakt, den man baut, einmal wegbranscht und dann führt man sich irgendwann zusammen. Genau. Mit der Hoffnung, dass man möglichst wenig kann. Da ist halt das Problem, dass du, ja, dass du halt, also genauso wie bei dem Datentyp, die Merge Order, dann erzeugt halt neue Commits. Und wenn unterschiedliche Teile mergen, automatisch irgendwie, dann kriegst du wieder neue Commits, die wieder gemerged werden müssen und das kann dazu eine Divergenz führen. Also das ist so yeah. das, das okay. dümmste Problem, was mir da so mhm. in den Weg gekommen ist. Genau, aber der, der Punkt ist halt, der jetzt zum Beispiel bei dem Social Network, du kannst halt jetzt auch hergehen, du kannst ja halt den Server verbinden mit, 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 so einem, mit, der, mit der Software und kannst hier den ganzen Stable einfach da rausziehen. 
Die Idee wäre dann halt, es über Encryption entsprechend dann dem Benutzer zu überlassen. Das heißt, es wird end zu end verschlüsselt wirklich da drin. Um, das habe ich mir auch angeguckt. Das sollte ja auch grundsätzlich gehen. Der das das Basisfall ist jetzt nicht so arg schwer, das zu machen. Um, sei denn, es gibt gestern einer zu mir gekommen, der mich angeschrieben hat, weil er will irgendwie sogar nicht sehen, wenn Schreiboperationen überhaupt passieren, weil du schon inferieren kannst, dass ein Angriff läuft, wenn irgendwo hingeschrieben wird. Und habe mich dann da habe ich mir gedacht, naja, okay, also das ist jetzt nicht, das war jetzt zum Beispiel nicht mein Problem, dass du das statistisch irgendwie auswerten kannst. Um, ja, also du kannst praktisch halt klonen. Also kannst du auch verbinden, kannst du subscriben, kannst du es holen und so weiter. Das ist halt, das wäre das Ziel, die ganze Motivation, der ganze Aufwand und letztendlich auch die, die Vermutung, dass da dann auch natürlich sowas wie gesellschaftlicher und eventuell auch kommerzieller Wert liegt. Also es ist besser, wenn du eine Anwendung bauen kannst und sagen kannst, die hängt nicht nur an meiner Firma, auch wenn das vielleicht am Anfang irgendwo dein Interesse ist, aber so über den Open Source Sachen, wo du halt auch sagen kannst, okay, ich Open Source das jetzt. Ähm, Dadurch gibt es auch Vertrauen in meine Lösung, weil andere wissen, wenn es mich in einem halben Jahr nicht mehr gibt, ist es nicht so schlimm. Wahrscheinlich gibt es diese Software immer noch in ein, zwei Jahren und ich kann die immer noch benutzen. Oder so. Das wäre die Frage, ob das valuable ist oder nicht. Das weiß ich nicht. 